invite your attention to the book of Ephesians, chapter number 4. Ephesians, chapter number 4, verses 19 and 20, as tonight we begin to look at the clean mind. In our continuing study of the power of biblical thinking, what's on your mind? Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 19. <coughs> who, being past, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. We thank you, Father, again for your word and pray now, Lord, that you will Work and bless in the message tonight. We pray you'll speak to our hearts. Help us, Lord, with our thoughts, that our thoughts would become pleasing unto you so that our actions and our lives could become pleasing unto you as well. We pray now, Father, these things in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. When we ask Jesus Christ into our lives to save us, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, such as our old sin and our old man, and all things are become new. That fact being true, how does sin creep back into our lives as children of God. If salvation saves us from our sin, which it does, and we become new creatures in Christ, which we become, how does sin creep back into our lives as believers in Christ? We know that we cannot lose our salvation because Jesus said in the Gospel of John chapter 10, in verses 28 and 29, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall not perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my, out of my hand. My father which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. So when sin does creep back into our life, it doesn't mean we lose our salvation if we could lose our salvation, then you know Christ would have to come and die again. And every time we sinned and lost our salvation, Christ would have to come and die again. I'm so glad that Christ came once for all, for all time, for our sins. And the forgiveness of our sins. So even though we may fall into sin, the Bible says that we cannot lose our salvation. But... We still have the problem of sin to deal with. Here in our text in Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 19 and 20, these verses give us the process whereby we allow sin into our minds and how we can combat it. Many a mother, after giving their sons a bath, have said, Now stay clean. Mom wants them to be clean for church or some other important function. It may be picture day at school, you know, and you, you dress up the kids so that they look their best for picture day at school. And then they get to school, and what happens? The white shirt is not white anymore. Because boys being boys... And dirt having a way of presenting itself. Well, we know what usually happens when boys are boys and dirt presents itself. The boys are in the dirt. And they get themselves dirty. And when God cleanses us from sin at salvation, he desires that we stay clean. But sin has a way of presenting itself, and that attack always begins 
in the mind. We see first here an insensitive conscience. There in the first phrase of verse number 19, who being past feeling. That comes, and that insensitive conscience comes with a seared mind, who being past feeling. Watch out. You have to watch out when you no longer sense the Holy Spirit of God speaking to you through his word when you read and study his word. If God is no longer speaking to your heart, there's a problem that needs to be fixed and addressed right away. Because we understand in our society what happens when a conscience becomes past feeling, when a mind becomes past feeling. We had an example of that on the 4th of July in Highland Park, Illinois. That was a conscience that was seared and past feeling. Because the person, I believe, who pulled the trigger and killed those people and wounded those people had no feeling at all, period. And people who do that kind of thing have no feeling at all, period. Because evil has gotten into their mind and their conscience has become seared. And their minds have become seared. And past feeling. Remember what we said earlier in our study about the brand on the flank of the cow? And how when that hot iron hits that flank of the cow, that the cow can't feel anything where that flank is. Because that flesh and those nerves have been seared so that they're beyond feeling. Like many a branded animal, we must not allow our conscience to become seared with a hot iron, as it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. We also see a sent message by God. God has a message for us today. He's given it to us in his word. God had a message for the nation of Israel that he sent through the prophet Jeremiah. Turn with me, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter number 5. The prophet Jeremiah, chapter number 5, and verses 20 through 22. Oh, there we go. Jeremiah, chapter 5. And verse number 20. Declare this now in the house of Jacob and publish it in Judah, saying, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. Fear ye not me, saith the Lord. Will ye not tremble at my presence, which have placed the sand for the bound of the sea? By a perpetual degree, that it cannot pass it. And though the waves thereof toss themselves, yet can they not prevail. Though they may roar, yet can they not pass over it. The God who sets the sand of the sea on the shoreline, even though the waves hit the shoreline all the time, there's still sand, isn't there? The God that does that. The nation of Israel was not fearing God at this time. They were worshiping idols. God was calling them back unto him. But by the time we get over, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter number 8. And in verse number 18, or verse number 12, excuse me. Verse number 12. 
we see how far the nation of Israel has gone. Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse number 12. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall in the time of their visitation. They shall be cast down, saith the Lord. God's calling them back to him, telling them to fear him. But just a little while later, the sins and the abominations that the nation of Israel had been committing, they wouldn't even blush at. Dr. Paul Brand was a physician who did much to advance the treatment of leprosy. As he lived among the lepers to study them and treat them, he would regularly take baths in scalding water. His purpose in this was to discover if there were any parts of his body where he might have lost feeling. He knew that if there were any parts of his body that had lost sensitivity to the boiling water, it was there that the leprosy had attacked him. This was taken from author Gordon MacDonald's Resilient Life, published in 2004. So where has your life become insensitive? A question we must ask ourselves, and ask it often. Because we live in a very insensitive society. Do we still blush at a curse word or immoral scene on TV? Are we still appalled by a lie? Does pride or bitterness bother us or has it become a pet sin in our life? Christians today are allowing words, thoughts, music, friends, entertainment, etc., into our lives that would have bothered their conscience just a few years ago. Conscience is that thing that hurts when everything else feels good. Cultivate a clear conscience, and it may turn out to be the best friend that you have ever had in your life. The polluting of our minds begins with an insensitive conscience. The mind also becomes polluted by an invited corruption. There is a ditch of wrong thinking. In our text in Ephesians chapter 4 and Again, in verse number 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. Once the conscience is seared, it's easy to plunge forward into wrong thinking. Because the conscience is not there to stop you. The door into our minds has been opened a crack. And sin just thinks it's been invited in automatically. It'd be like the preacher showing up for supper on a random night that you didn't invite him to come. Hopefully you'd be kind and gracious to him as you threw him out. But... <laughs> That's how sin is. If sin has a little crack in our mind, it'll just invite itself in. It doesn't ask permission. It just walks in. 
We must guard against that. It's amazing how you can't just sin a little. And then say, that's enough. Sin never stays a little and then goes away. It always grows. That little sin in our minds can grow until it causes our whole life to change direction. We also see the disaster of woeful transgression. Dr. Getz shares the story of his kidney stones. Those of you who have had kidney stones could probably relate. I haven't. I've been blessed that way thus far in my life. He shares this story. Recently, I had my first experience with kidney with a kidney stone. I went to bed as normal on Saturday night after driving most of the day to get to a church so that I could preach the service the next morning. <coughs> About 10 minutes into sleep, I was awakened by an intense pain in my abdomen. I tried everything over the next two hours to rid myself of that horrible pain, but nothing worked. After arriving to an emergency room in a strange, in a strange town, they gave me some morphine and did a CAT scan. Five hours later... I was given the news. You have a kidney stone. Textbook symptoms. You should pass it in the next few hours. As the doctor was sending me home, he instructed me to try to catch the stone so that they could study it and find out its cause as he handed me a strainer, quote unquote. I asked him what I was looking for. He said, oh, you won't be impressed. It'll be about the size of a grain of sand. I had heard that the pain of passing a kidney stone was like having a baby. I thought, a grain of sand? I'm about to deliver a world-class midget. How could such a little thing create so much torment? That's how sin is. Start small. Hardly notice it. Until... It starts to cause pain. Like that grain of sand creating such an intense pain, we, when we open the door of our mind to the thoughts of sin, we are asking for big problems. It's no wonder that Paul so emphatically wrote back in the book of Romans chapter 13, <clears throat> Excuse me. And verse number 14. Romans 13 and verse 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Back in Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse number 27. The Bible says there, neither give place to the devil. Give the devil an inch, he'll take your life every time. Solomon also warned his son in the book of Proverbs and Proverbs chapter 1 and, and verse number 10. <coughs> Excuse me. Proverbs chapter 1 and in verse number 10. He says there, my son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Hey, why don't you come with me and my buddies? We're going to go out for a beer after work. No, thank you. Consent thou not. Evangelist Billy Sunday used to say, if you don't want to sin, stay out of the devil's neighborhood. 
He has a good point. See, there is too much window shopping at the mall of sin nowadays by believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though malls are going out of style, I do understand that. The mall of sin, though, is still operating and operating well. Only fools fool around with sin. Flirting with temptation always leads to a romance with sin. And a romance with sin leads to destruction of one's life. Even the life of a Christian. The, Lord, the devil can't take our soul. We know Christ is our Savior. We know we're going to heaven. But the devil can take everything else. He can take our reputation. He can take our testimony. He can take our marriage. He can take our finances. He can take everything else from us. And the funny thing about it is that we usually allow it ourselves. We must think about that as we go through 